you I have not met, thank you. For those of you I have not met, my name is Mariel. I serve as the Director of Career Services here at Chandler School of Theology. And I'm very excited about tonight because one of the things that comes up very frequently in my sessions with students is around chaplaincy. Uh, and so we thought it would be a good idea to introduce you to various forms of chaplaincy. What are the requirements for those? And so we have some awesome folks on tonight. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves in a few minutes. But I would like to do a few housekeeping things for a second. So the first thing is this session has been recorded. So, <laughs> so if you don't want a question on the recording, um, actually, I'm going to come back to that. Just drop it in the Q&A. Or if you want to just ask, ask you in the breakout rooms, that's totally fine. So don't feel pressured that you have to do that in this session, in the general session. The other thing is please use the Q&A feature. So it does not get lost in the chat. If you do have a question for the panel, you can drop it in the Q&A. Either I or Diana will see that. Diana, wave your hand. Yeah, there she is. Um, and we'll be looking at the Q&A feature just to make sure we can answer questions. Um, once the breakout rooms are open, yes, dialogue as much as you would like. I think in the main room, we're only gonna take written questions just to make the time go by a little bit faster. And then in the breakout rooms, you can definitely talk to your heart's delight. Um, and then after the event is over, we will be sending out a brief survey just to hear how this was for you. Um, it takes less than a minute. I timed it. Um, it takes less than a minute. So um, if you could do that for us so we can really work on programming to really help you all as much as possible, that would be fantastic. All right, so we're going to get right into it, all right? So I'm going to have our chaplains introduce themselves. And so chaplains, um, I'm going to go in the order on my screen. If you could tell your name, um, if you could tell us the industry that you chaplaincy in, where you are located in the world, and if you can kind of tell us how long you've been doing this work, um, that would be great. So again, your name the industry that you are currently doing chaplaincy in, uh, where you are located in the world, and then also how long you've been doing this work. And I'm gonna go with the first person that I see, and that is Katie. So if you don't mind introducing yourself, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Katie Dean. Um, I'm a hospital chaplain at Emory Decatur Hospital. So I'm located here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I started my hospital chaplaincy journey in the fall of 21, um, the fall before I graduated with my MDiv. Um, I did my internship at Emory Decatur, and then I moved into a residency at Emory Decatur. Um, and now I am a certified educator candidate at Emory Decatur. So I'm doing clinical work as well as a uh, advising um, incoming CPE interns and residents. Um, and I am a provisional board certified chaplain as well. Thank you so much. Um, Matthew, I see you next. You can introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Matthew. I'm firm by he or they pronouns. Um, I have done a lot of my chaplaincy um, among activists um, in a social justice context, and also serving at my church now. Um, we serve a lot of activists in the Atlanta area. That's where I do a lot of my work as well as uh, political organizing work. And um, I have been really serving as a movement chaplain um, in a significant way for the past four years, I would say. It's good to be with you all tonight. Thank you so much, uh, Cerise. Hello, friends. It's good to see everyone. Um, my name is Cerise Barton. I am in Atlanta as well. Um, I currently serve at Change Church um, up in Duluth, but I also get an opportunity to serve with the Atlanta Dream here. And so it's the sports chaplaincy um, field that I get to serve with. I luckily have been able to do it though. This is my fourth season. So all while I was at Candler, um, I was able to spend a season with um, these amazing women who kind of just take on the WNBA by storm, of course. And so um, I'm just going to say it. And I'm in Atlanta. I said that part. I'll save all the other stuff that I plan to say later. <laughs> but it's good to see you, Katie, again. And I love the strides that you've been making since I've known you, too. Yes, it's a family reunion. On, it on totally. Miss <laughs> <laughs> um, Terry. 
Are you good to go? You... I think so. If you can hear me, I am. Yeah. Yes. Great. Um, I'm. My name is Terry Maru. I um, am continuing my contextual education slash internship at the Hartsfield Jackson International Airport. So I am the theologian in residence there, and I primarily focus on honor guards as my first priority, serving our military recruits, and then my congregates, which is up to about 60 people of the 67,000 I see. I see about um, 60 plus folks every Sunday for the more liturgical side of what I do. I love it. I love it. Maddie. Bye. Hi, everyone. I'm Maddie. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Christian chaplain at Emory University in the Office of Spiritual and Religious Life. So I work with the broader Emory University campus, primarily serving undergraduate students, but our office does, does serve the whole university. Um, and I, um, so higher education, specific industry, and how long I have been doing this work, um, specifically at Emory, I'm in my fourth year. Nice. Last but certainly not least, um, Chaplain Gomez, are you on? Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Gomez. Um, I'm from Houston, Texas. Uh, I work, or actually, I do three things, actually. Uh, we actually feed the homeless out in Houston, Texas, um, in every way, every way possible, um, not just by feeding the homeless, but giving clothes and food and hygiene. However, my main focus right now has been the TDCJ, uh, actually prison ministry. Uh, our focus right now at the moment is women um, due to the, the state of Texas having not the same favor for women as they do for men. Uh, the other part that we also do is that we also do trauma. Uh, we do trauma for our church. Um, I have been with Lakewood Church for a very long time, probably 35 years now as a minister uh, for trauma. So yes, uh, welcome to Houston, everyone. I love it. So with all of this vast experience, we're gonna have an incredible conversation. So I think the first question I kind of wanna toss out there is how do you define the role of a chaplain in your specific context? What would you say um, if you had to talk to someone who does not know what chaplaincy is or what a chaplain does in your context, what would that look like? And I don't know who would like to start. I can start calling on y'all if I need to, if that's helpful. Okay, Cerise, I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> right when you said calling on people, I was like, oh boy. I was like, Katie, come on, step up. <laughs> um, So a little bit of background just to understand like kind of the context specifically for serving the WMBA, it means that we have a liturgical function. So within that liturgical function, our job is to host a chapel service before the game. So every um, there's a chaplain serving every single team throughout all of the WMBA. So whoever's the home team is responsible for putting on literally a mini worship service um, which I'm so grateful for my time spent with Dean Williams in the worship department. So putting on a small worship service before the game at 60 minutes before the game, they they literally just come to us, those who want to. So um, yeah, 15 minutes is all we get. So we have an opportunity in that space to, to host a moment of worship, to give them a word, um, because this might be the only church that they can afford is in time to go through throughout the week. Um, and so this is happening at every home game all around. Um, so in that context, our job is essentially to do a liturgical function. But the good part about the job is based on when you build relationships, there's additional conversations, additional prayer based on if there's additional stress going on in their life or the transitions or injury and all the mental parts that come with the game throughout the entire season, we get to deal with that pressure. And based on the relationship, it may take you know, an hour a person, or we may schedule a different um, times to do Bible study. We essentially, and I love to say this word, we just a companion. We are walking alongside doing life during the season so that they can handle the pressures. Um, we're also then building, and I know for me personally, I'm expanding onto the little bit of the entrepreneurial side. So I hang around and still chaplain people during when they're overseas during the remainder of the year. So I get to accompany people throughout all of life's journey. So for, for me, chaplaincy is that companion for the year. Um, 
guidance, compassionate listening, um, narrating the conversation to help them answer the questions of their heart. Um, and we, I know we're going to get into a little bit about how our faith plays out to that when someone has a different faith than ours, but to answer the question quickly in the, in the function of what we're supposed to do as a chaplain serving the WNBA is we are supposed to hold a liturgical sacred space for them before the game. I love that. I just learned something new. I didn't know that y'all had to do worship, 15 minute worship services before, like for every home game. Wow. So you game. really have to like know how to get it done because <laughs> 15 minutes isn't yes. long. <laughs> like, Thanks wow. for if anybody's had Dr. Fire Brown's preaching class, you could say a lot in 10 minutes. <laughs> yes, exactly. So Matthew, I want to toss it to you because um, movement chaplaincy actually was new to me when I first got to Candler. And I've really been learning more about movement chaplaincy and I've had some students who've asked that. So just curious, what does chaplaincy look like? What is movement chaplaincy and how does that play out? Sure. Um, I finished Divinity School in um, 2019, moved back to Atlanta around the summer of 2019 and got involved with lots of um, activists in the Atlanta area. And I think that the biggest thing about um, doing work as a movement chaplain is presence. A lot of people that have dedicated themselves uh, to doing movement work. Many of them uh, may have some background of, you know, church hurt, right? Many of us do that have, you know, grown up uh, with Christianity as it is in the United States, right? Most people might even, you know, have like some frame of reference for that. So there are a lot of people who have seen uh, activism as the way that they can impact the world and create the world that they want to see where they haven't necessarily uh, seen people doing that in religious spaces. Um, so in many ways, uh, there is a commitment to creating a you know, better world that's shared among people, which is kind of the starting ground. Uh, so uh, especially if you've been in the Atlanta area over the past four years uh, as an activist, you may have seen some very wild um, the first environmental activist ever um, killed by police in the United States uh, happened here last year. Um, you know, there were um, there have been lots of different social justice movements um, in the Atlanta area, and um, there has been a significant amount of unhealthy interactions with the police. There's currently a RICO case. Uh, among activists for the Stop Cop City movement. So there are a lot of people that are dealing with trauma. Um, and where I've come in is like having that presence because um, a lot of folks in these circles really haven't had positive experiences with religious leaders. So um, me having consistently been in spaces and showing up for people, uh, is like the first step and um, one of the reasons why I have credibility uh, in these areas because I've had continued presence. Um, and that also means just being able to maintain very strict confidentiality uh, because especially with our current political context, many of the things that people tell me um, could be incriminating, right? And so it's just uh, very important for us to be able to hold space and care for people, whether that be, you know, sometimes at direct actions, holding space and being able to take people away in strenuous times, or just being there and showing up for people uh, after actions, um, and just really holding space and showing up for folks where they are at. Um, I'm currently at Park Avenue Baptist Church, uh, and we have been very committed in our abolitionist principles. And so now this is, you know, a space and ground where a lot of people that otherwise would not be involved with the church uh, feel safe and welcome. And that's a lot of the work that we do, just making sure that we are holding space and letting people know and supporting and affirming them um, without ever anything being proselytizing in any way. Um, so I, I, I hope that that gets at the question. It definitely does. Um, 
Maddie, would you like to talk to us about what does chaplaincy look like in higher ed? I will. Yes. Um, I also, Matthew, we could have used you last semester. Um, a lot of holding space after events. So, um, I, I love those students. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I define chaplaincy in higher ed similarly, um, but as a companion on the journey. Um, and the journey that I get is the four years they are here or, you know, the six years they're here for graduate school or three for divinity, whatever it might be, but the journey through education. And um, that looks like getting a lot of coffee with people um, and just hearing their stories. I was actually doing my uh, receipts today and I was like, Caldies, Caldies, which is one of the coffee shops on campus, as y'all know. And so it's like lots of Caldies. Um, and, um, but it also looks like being a presence for faculty and staff, which is a really cool thing that we get to do. Um, there's a great book of, um, chaplains, um, I think it's higher ed chaplaincy in the 21st century, but Susan Henry Crow, who was at Emory for a long time, has a essay in there. And she talks about being one of the few people on campus who invites people to pause in their day that campus is always bustling from the moment class before classes start, let's be honest, to after classes end. And so inviting people to pause. Um, so that's that's a little bit about higher ed chaplaincy. Thank you, um, Katie. So I think people think they have an idea of what chaplaincy is in the hospital, but I think there's some things they may not know. So what does chaplaincy look like in the hospital context? Sure. Um, I had a, I have a feeling we're all going to echo each other. Um, you know, it involves compassion and presence and active listening and companionship. Um, we offer emotional and spiritual support to patients, families, and staff. Um, so we're involved in the life of the hospital. Um, we do, we respond to consult requests. So patients, family, staff can make requests to see a chaplain. Um, and sometimes that looks like responding to spiritual distress. Sometimes that looks like responding to emotional distress. Um, we respond to deaths and dying situations, but that's not all we do. Um, we, we, I also use the word companion. We companion with people through their healthcare journey, um, but our time with them is very, very short. So in my context at Emory Decatur, I usually only see patients once or twice while they're there. Um, and our visits are often very brief as well. So 15 to 30 minutes. And so we get a glimpse into their whole life story. Um, and we're there to actively listen to them and listen to the spiritual needs that have not been met in their life, in their story at the hospital and communicate that to the healthcare team and kind of hold in tandem the needs that the medical team are trying to provide and the needs that the, the patients and families are trying to provide. So it is a balancing act between those two things. Um, and we also provide a lot of staff support. So we cold round through units on patients, but we also cold round on units for the staff of just consistent checking in on everybody. How are you doing? And that became, as everyone knows, that became more than essential during the pandemic. And we've strived at Emory Decatur to keep that up as well. I love it. Miss Terry, oh wait, before you say something. So as you all are listening to the various areas, um, feel free to drop questions in the Q&A um, box. So I really wanna lend this time to your questions. I do have questions prepared, but students, if you have questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat and then, well, not the chat, but the Q&A portion. Um, and then we will answer those questions. I asked the, the panelists. All right, Ms. Terry, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> you know, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Are, is it is it my you, turn? Yes, it is you. So awesome. if you can tell us about what it's like doing chaplaincy in the airport 
one of the yeah. busiest airport no the busiest airport where in not just the nation is in it the world? world no it's the world's yeah. busiest airport correct yeah <laughs> correct and that's really a function of the delta hub and spoke system so the truth is many people are coming through us not destination with us and so it's an exciting and wonderful and exhausting place to be and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, as we speak right now, there is an international chaplain association who is meeting in Germany. So there are many chaplains around the world and uh, most of them have one to two paid staff people and the rest are volunteers. I am fortunate that uh, the Episcopal Diocese uh, uh, fund, private funders have asked me to stay on at least for another couple of months so I can finish up some research that we've been doing with our honor guards. If you don't know what that is, that's a whole nother conversation, but it's a true privilege to be with our fallen heroes and their families and the escorts um, that come through our airport um, and the vast amount of military folks that are there. We get a lot of recruits that are going to Fort Benning, Fort Moore, and to be able to hand out Gideon Bibles. I had no idea I'd be so in love with the Gideons after all my decades as a recovering philanthropy consultant. They're my new favorite nonprofit. So, you know, that's just one small part of it. And I know we all like to see the pretty pictures of people running through the airports in love and on their way to honeymoons. And that's not the only reason people travel. And so the idea of being a chaplain and being comfortable um, with walking up to people or anytime someone's crying, even yesterday I was with this, you know, horrifically tragic, horrible honor guard situation and someone was hysterically crying. I said, excuse me, pulled myself over to try to manage that kind of what I believe is a chaplain emergency in an airport situation, get that covered and then resume my work. So it's a lot of walking. My bishop suggested I wear, wear tennis shoes and I have worn out three pairs. So it is just a delight and an excitement. And I am deeply committed to the future of chaplaincy in non-traditional spaces, especially corporate chaplaincy, and all of them must be funded. Yes. yes. Snaps on that. <laughs> I agree with you, baby. Yep. Snaps on that. Last but certainly not least, uh, Miss Elizabeth, what is what does chaplaincy look like in the prison setting? Um, and how how does how does a day look for you typically? Oh wait, you're on mute. I think I'm like. In the prison ministry, it's a it's a little bit different as a chaplain because not only, um, and we tell everybody every day that you know as a chaplain and as a chaplain lay person, you also have to stay in your fourteen forty. You got to stay in the moment. You got to stay in the zone. You have to be and come prepared. You got to be anointed before you get in. Only for the simple fact is because you don't want somebody else's residue to fall upon you. Yes, and by the time you get in they can actually feel the anointing as soon as you walk in. And what's amazing is in chaplaincy, prison chaplaincy, it's not just about the offenders, actually. It's more about the workers. It's about the officers, yes. It's also about uh, the people that actually come and visit the family. You would be amazed on how a parent or a loved one or a husband is still going through a lot, either denial or brokenness. So you have to be there for them also. Not just that, but you also have, because there's there's one unit that's really amazing. I think that everybody will really truly enjoy. It's a mission field that everybody kind of forgets. It's a, it's a hospital actually. And that hospital in prison has three areas, right? So it has the people that are healthy. It has the people that are sick and it has the people that are dying. So you also have to know hospice. So in that situation, your compassion has to be from the, from the front door all the way to the back door and which that means is every offender every every worker every nurse every doctor every patient because every patient's different but even as an offender um you know when you try to assist them you have to understand that you got to step back listen to their story and make sure that you don't fall into the game because honestly uh, there's games in prison, just like everything else, right? So the the hard part about chaplaincy is you not allowing yourself to stay in your 1440. You got to stay in your zone. And otherwise, you can get confused because between 
the actual worker asking for assistance or whether it's a death that happened in hospice for that day, now you have the whole unit in a sad mode. So now you have to be the eyes and ears and the arms of compassion when all this trauma is happening. Because at the time that trauma is happening, it's not just trauma of somebody dying at the unit, but it's also the trauma that maybe it was somebody's bunkie and they were living together for, you know, for, I don't know, 10 years. And when it's your bunkie, it becomes your best friend. And that's a tough one to live with and for the offender that's staying. However, when it doesn't stop there because you have volunteers from all ethnicities, right? So all the volunteers are coming to you also as guidance as leadership, as, as a bending ear. So I hope that helps everybody in, in such a way because it's a mission field that has been forgotten and not everybody, leaves, not everybody believes in second chances. And in that second chances, you also have to understand that there is a recovery mode too. They're gonna go home one day. How long do you have with them? With some people, you might just have one year with them some people you might have 20 years with. So what is it that you're putting in their toolbox every day as a chaplain? And what are you doing to the toolbox of the chaplain assistants from the unit that work for you? How are you actually so showing Jesus actually? And how are they embracing it? And what, how are they taking it back into their dorms? So that's about it. <laughs> That's Thank a, you. That's a small version. Yeah, somebody say, I know it's way more layered and complex. Um, so we're going to do kind of a lightning round of questions because we actually have three questions that have come through. So the first question that I really want to dive into that is the top question that I typically get in my space is, do you have to do CPE? Is CPE required in your fields of chaplaincy? And I don't know who wants to go first. Do I need to call people again or anybody want to jump in? I'll go real quick. It was not required for me here at Emory. It is required by some universities. So it just depends um, on the place. Same story here for prison ministry uh, or prison chaplaincy. What I mean by that is every state's different. Texas does require CPE somewhere between 60 to 300 hours. It just varies. I'll go for sports chaplaincy. It's not a requirement, but for me, it was a requirement for the chaplaincy certification at Candler. But I will also say that CPE is really what taught me how to do everything that I, I'm currently doing. Even though I started as a chaplain before, um, just in my MDiv, um, that experience at Grady Hospital, like listening to Katie, what you said, and even some of the stuff that Terry, you said, all of those things I learned, like the practice of who I am and how I show up, I learned in those hardcore 800 hours doing a summer session intensive um, at Grady Hospital. So um, I know a lot of people may ask that question because they're wondering if they have time to do it. Um, I know sometimes it may not be time during the MDiv, but in that summer after your MDiv, um, I wouldn't definitely think about like, is it a requirement or is it something you really should go after? figure out a way of how you, why you consider it one way or another. Ditto, not required, but I believe 100% essential. So please do it. Yeah, it is essential. It is required in the hospital. Um, you Most hospitals will not hire you without at least four units of CPE. And they want you to be pursuing board certification or be board certified. Um, and that requires an additional 2,000 clinical hours of working in a hospital after your CPE. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to say, um, definitely not required um, doing, you know, movement chaplaincy. However, uh, I went back for CPE this last summer. And this is me five years out of uh, school, just having the opportunity, the time window, and you know the resources at the time to be able to just take that time out. I wanted to make sure that I was as trained, especially with me doing you know more chaplaincy in a church context, 
And I'll just say you won't regret it. You won't regret it. Uh, I know that uh, during my time in school, it was a financial concern. Can I afford not to work all summer? And then uh, the programs in Chicago were significantly more expensive. It would have been $1,500 for the tuition, where down here it was $300, which I think may have been an adjustment even after COVID. Uh, so, I mean, the things that discouraged me were, you know, material condition. Um, but I do think that it is worth the time and like just carving out the time for you to be able to do it because it will help in a pastoral context as well. That's a great segue because the next question that was uh, heavily asked is, do I need to be ordained in my particular denomination to be a chaplain? Whoever wants to jump on that one first. I can go for, for the sports side of what I do. And even as serving um, another network that we put together is basically called black sports ministry network. So in both of those contexts that I serve, I do not need to be ordained. However, I'm still pursuing ordination since also getting my master's because as many of you know, if anybody had class with me, I want the whole bag. I want everything that's afforded at my fingertips so that I can never be limited from what I can do. But in sports or an entrepreneurial chaplaincy, you do not need to be well, in the areas that I serve, maybe not all of them, I do not need to be ordained as well. In TDC, we do we do ask for everybody to go ahead and stay ordained only for the simple reason is because of death certificates, actually, and because of having to uh, sign off on major, huge information that, that the state, the state requires for the family and the future. Yes. For higher ed, I would say it depends on the institution. Um, for Emory, it, if I'm remembering the job posting correctly, it was strongly preferred United Methodist. I don't remember if that was re a requirement. It may have been a requirement for Emory. So, you know, denominationally affiliated institutions, it's going to be more likely. Um, and it, I would also say it might depend on if you are sort of like the... Um, director of spiritual life or dean of religious life or university chaplain, kind of the head honcho versus the um, kind of more uh, like entry level chaplain role. It would just depend. I actually started this role um, without being a reverend. Um, I am a commissioned deacon in the United Methodist Church. So I'm in the process. And I think I was hired with the knowledge that I was in the process, but it was not ordained when I started. Technically, I'm still not fully retained. So some, someone mentioned the LA Times article. When this program was created by the Episcopal Diocese, there was a priest that was hired by the diocese to work full time. And then she invited a chaplain that was not ordained. And the two of them ran the program for several years pre-COVID. Um, and that can become a bone of contention with some people. It's not required. You must be endorsed, as with most chaplains. Um, but it all depends on what is your individual call. So I am called to ordain, bless, and consecrate. So I am still in almost a never-ending um, semi-ordination process that allows me to work directly with a priest, because especially with honor guards and those kinds of issues that um, have sadly arisen over the last three years, uh, it's it 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 for my denomination. It really requires that I reach out to others, and I have often said, especially if there's a Catholic priest involved, that will there are times when we need to bring the Catholic priest in, and that's to me the most important part of the true interfaith part of this. Is that no matter what faith tradition you are, if you're if you're working in an interfaith space, um, to be committed to that. And I'm going to go back to you because Candler is the perfect place. I got to practice my Arabic, and I got to learn more of my Hindi, and you know you can do all of that right on campus um, with the extraordinary offerings that are available to you. For those of you that have not had any of that, you could get just enough to say please and thank you and God bless you in other languages. So I say yes to ordination if that's your call. No, if you'd like to come work with us at the airport as a volunteer. So my answer is kind of complicated. Um, to If you're pursuing professional hospital chaplaincy, it's really highly recommended that you be board certified. 
Board certification requires you be endorsed by your religious group. Um, so some Christian denominations like Catholicism don't ordain women, but they will or endorse women for chaplaincy, um, where other denominations like um, the United Methodist denomination will only endorse you if you're ordained. Um, so it really depends on what your religious group is um, to when it comes to endorsement for board certification. Um, so it, it's kind of a complicated answer. And if you're pursuing, if you want to pursue hospital chaplaincy, really get to understand what your religious group requires um, to fulfill endorsement. Matthew, did you want to contribute? Did you want to answer that question about ordination? Uh, yeah, in my particular context, not, not. <laughs> right, <laughs> I figured. So we have a few questions that I'm gonna try to get through. There was a question about um, the hours about board certification. Whoever asked that question, I want you to talk to Katie directly in the breakout rooms to kind of go more into that. So I'll say that for um, the breakout rooms. So one of the questions is, what is one utterly unique aspect of your field of chaplaincy? Um, for those who know chaplaincy is their calling, but want to further narrow down their potential roles. So what is a, if that makes your field of chaplaincy incredibly unique? Um, I think some of y'all may have answered that when we first started, but if you want to give an example of something you encountered potentially, um, just to kind of show what that looks like and why this is, what's a unique aspect in your context? I don't know if that this is like strict to hospital, but it's one thing that I enjoy the most out of what I do um, is the diversity of who I get to be with. Um, so at Emory Decatur, we function as interfaith chaplains and we call on other religious leaders when necessary. And there are a lot of moments where we do that. Um, but we visit everybody. Um, every, no matter their religion, race, ethnicity, language, um, and that goes for staff as well. And one of my, some of my most valued experiences with patients and families are those who are different from me. Um, and to, to really just sit and actively listen to what they're going through and connect the dots between their spiritual values and their physical needs. Um, and work with the hospital team. We are part of the healthcare team. So we are involved in medical rounds um, and interdisciplinary meeting, team meetings when discussing, discussing patient care. Um, and so the diversity and the um, involvement in the healthcare teams are the two things that I value the most. Anybody else wanna share and answer that question? All of you don't have to, because I have a couple more questions. Yeah, this might not be specific to all higher ed chaplains, but one of the coolest things that I think I get to do in my work is that our office, so we're the Office of Spiritual and Religious Life, we work with the medical school when students are in the cadaver labs for um, its um, medical students, um, PA, so physician's assistant assistance and physical therapy program. They all work in the cadaver lab. And on the first day before they have their, they call it the first cut day before they do that. One of us, at least one of the chaplains is in the, um, anatomy lab with the students. So when we do sort of a processing of like, what are you feeling? You're about to be around to this body. You're about to be working on this body. Um, and then we go in throughout the semester, um, a couple of times. And then at the end of the semester, we do a service of gratitude with the students where they get to um, either offer reflections and their faculty member helps with that as well. And then we also facilitate a um, memorial service for the families of the donors once a year. And that is in conjunction with students from Morehouse because the program is with both schools. And this was 
My second day in this role, I went to a service of gratitude and that, that might be why I love it so much, but it's one of the most unique things I think that we get to do. So obviously not every school has a medical school, but it's like, I think it shows the reach that a chaplaincy office can have in higher ed across all programs and degree programs. But that is one of the coolest things that I get to do. I'll add just one thing that um, that I feel is unique is that we get to be a space where there's like no cameras for once. I think that most of the ladies can appreciate um, a space where they can feel just seen for who they are um, and even who they're journeying to be. Um, I think they really appreciate a sacred space where um, they could just feel like themselves for once. Um, I love that one of the things that we get to do is... Um, to offer that space, but also a part of it that's also unique is during the high intensity of a season, um, we, we get to offer a word of encouragement, but also what we've done this season, and I think the last season too, is we also approach it from a womanist point of view. And so the theology of like a house that I may belong to in my denomination, I don't have to worry about the restrictions of what we preach to them. It's more or less like we can speak womanist specifically to them, to their struggle, to what they're dealing with in the WNBA, in the league, even where they play, we get to bring spirituality to the fact that they have sacred bodies and sacred things that they need to do for their bodies, rituals of self-care. Um, so we've been able to kind of twist it a little bit to give them a different type of care, a very intentional type of care during a very stressful season where they might be new on a team and still trying to find community and belonging, struggling with an injury, struggling with identity, um, some specific things there. So those are the two two unique things I'd lift besides just the liturgy that we get to do. We get to be intentional about how they get to show up in a space um, without me having to press down a denominational um, specifics that they may want us to do if we were preaching from that space. I think with the prison ministry, I keep calling it ministry, but it's chaplaincy. The idea is that um, not only are we working with the offenders there at the unit, but we also work with the families as they're going into reentry, which means that we follow through, not just as a chaplain. What happens is that we uh, continue to talk to their parents and encourage the parents and, or the loved one or the husband or the spouse or the children that they have. Um, what we do is actually re we help them reconnect to the family and how to readjust, how to modify and adjust in the real world. Because as you're mentoring them on the inside of Bob Wire, remember they're going to go home one day or we hope and what we do is we continue to follow up with them on the outside be behind on the other side of what the people call the free world the amazing part is this world isn't free uh the gospel is the only thing that is free uh but this free world that everybody's always in a hurry to uh somet sometimes gets them down so you'd be amazed in how many telephone calls as a chaplain you will get at the unit from people that have already gone home, it could have been six months, it could have been five years. And so and so says, you know, is this Chaplain Gomez, you know, and I say yes. And do you remember me? Well, the problem is, you know, when they start talking to you, and they kind of say certain things, you might remember them, but half of the time you don't. But when you listen to them about their situation and their circumstance or trauma or issue, you're also on the telephone trying to help somebody not come back in and let recidivism go down. So we have several questions for individual chaplains. So I want to respect that and go ahead and potentially open up the breakout rooms. Um, Maddie, there's like at least two for you. Cerise, there's one for you. So I would rather give students the opportunity to just ask directly in the room. So here's how this is going to work. Um, students, this is very informal. So you can go to different breakout rooms if you want to spend some time with Maddie, if you want to spend some time with Cerise, if you want to spend some time with Matthew. So that way you can ask specific questions to their respective industries. Don't be shy. Um, this isn't mandatory, um, but we did want to create a more intimate space that will not be recorded, FYI. Um, so what you ask will be confidential to the chaplains and in that space. 
Um, so don't be shy. Um, Diana, do you see how to open the breakout rooms? Do you see that? Because I may have to do it on my end. Okay. Um, chaplains, your names are listed, I think, as... So if you want to just join your... Or I can put you in there. It's up to you. But um, so like... Yeah, I'll just move y'all there. And then students, y'all can go as you see fit. Um, you can go there. <clears throat> Did it open for students? Do y'all see? Deanne Brad just saw your hand raised. I don't know if she's still in here or not. Yeah, I was looking for the breakout room. Yeah. It should be in the bottom right corner. It just says leave. Really? Okay, hold on for a second. Wait. 